Hello and welcome to Live with Mighty Hive. Uh, today's episode is a programmatic buyer's look at the ISBA report's unknown delta. Uh, this is the thing everyone has been talking about. Uh, with me today is uh, Rachel Adams, uh, Mighty Hive Head of Media Activation. Uh, I am your host, Miles Younger. Thanks again for, uh, for coming and being with us today. A uh, little bit about Live with Mighty Hive in case uh, you have not seen an episode before. These are information packed chats with digital media and analytics experts. You can subscribe at livewithmightyhive.splashthat.com. And if you have questions, feedback, uh, episode ideas, uh, get in touch with us at live at mightyhive.com. We would be absolutely thrilled to hear from you. A little bit about Mighty Hive. Mighty Hive is a new breed of media consultancy. We offer uh, services and consulting across uh, digital and programmatic media, analytics, and data strategy. We are a global company with offices uh, in North America, Latin America, Europe, Asia Pacific. Uh, and then over here on the right hand side of your screen, you can see a couple of our esteemed clients. If you want to learn more, go to mightyhive.com or reach out to questions at mightyhive.com. Okay, so uh, let's get into this episode, a programmatic buyer's look at the ISBA reports unknown delta. Um, before we kick things off, two housekeeping notes. One, the uh, complete recording and slides will be available later. And then we're going to do live Q&A at the end. You can ask questions at any time. Uh, use your Q&A button in Zoom. Don't do the raise hand thing. Don't do the chat. Just use the Q&A button. All right. So um, this is what we're talking about today. Uh, the ISBA Programmatic Supply Chain Transparency Study. Um, conducted by the UK's uh, ISBA um, came out about two weeks ago. Uh, if you go to isba.org.uk, you can access the study itself. Highly recommend it. Um, it's very substantive, really good stuff. So just in summary, to, to uh, set the groundwork here, uh, this study, like I said, came about at two weeks ago. It was conducted by the ISBA uh, in partnership with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to do the auditing, uh, and then the Association of Online Publishers. Uh, it was uh, comprised of 15 advertisers, eight agencies, five DSPs, five SSPs, 12 publishers, all working very closely together to do these audits. Uh, you know, we're talking 267 uh, million impressions, 2.2 billion lines of data. There's a lot of data they sifted through um, to roll things up into this report. And, you know, one of the kind of headline findings is they were able to roll everything up into this industry uh, waterfall uh, where they found about 51% of, um, of spend going to publishers as publisher revenue about 34% as uh, just sort of miscellaneous fees, which we'll kind of get into a little bit uh, later. And then there was this 15% unattributable, unauditable, unknowable, unknown delta uh, uh, that everybody's been talking about. And um, actually, before I go on to the next slide, uh, over on your uh, left, uh, there is uh, a little thumbnail of a webinar that the Association of uh, Canadian Advertisers did. Oh, I want to say the day the report came out, actually. Uh, it's on LinkedIn, and I think you should be seeing a link to um, view that webinar in Zoom chat just about now. Highly recommend it. Rachel and I both watched it in our prep. Um, the ISBA is on the webinar, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers is on the webinar, uh, uh, RATCO from ad profs is on, uh, it's, it's super informational. So highly recommend checking that out. So in this report, you know, it basically, it turns out, surprise, surprise, that auditing programmatic spend is still quite challenging. And in case you don't know what we're looking at, this is a Renaissance era painting of the Tower of Babel, which I'm not going to tell you the, the Tower of Babel story. Hopefully you, you, you get the reference, um, you know, because in this, in this study, they called out all kinds of challenges, uh, you know, out of over 200 million impressions, they could only match 12% of them. So even the findings of the study are based only on a fraction of the data. 
uh, the study took nine months longer than expected. I think the entire study time was like 15 months in large part because they had so much trouble just accessing the data. Uh, and then, uh, you know, one of the findings, there was 15 advertisers, 12 publishers added up to 300 distinct supply chains. That's not actual multiplication. 15 by times 12 is not 300. It's actually significantly less. So there's just, there's a lot of complexity. And then it, it, it finally, this unknown delta, the 15% on the previous slide, that was just an average. It actually ranged from as low as 0%, which is great, all the way up to 86% in at least one case, because that was the high end of the range. Um, and so what this really all boils down to is clearly there are still challenges of uh, complexity and transparency in the programmatic ecosystem. Um, and on that note, if you want to read more uh, uh, along, those, along those lines, uh, our CEO, Pete Kim, published a, uh, a blog post uh, to MightyHive.com last week called Marketers Deserve Better. So if you want to learn more about our POV on uh, complexity and transparency, uh, in addition to what we say on this webinar, invite you to go check that out. All right. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Rachel Adams, uh, head of media activation at Mighty Hive. Um, she joined Mighty Hive in 2016. Uh, she's employee number 36, which I believe we're like up over 400 employees now. So this is significant. She's, she's a veteran at Mighty Hive. Uh, previous to Mighty Hive was an agency planner and buyer. Um, she's held a ton of leadership roles across uh, the company over the years in account management, and then in, uh, within client in-housing engagements like Sprint uh, and Bayer that you may have uh, read about in the trade press. Uh, and currently uh, in her role as head of media activation, she is focused on digital media planning and buying best practices and new to market digital media opportunities. So uh, with that, welcome, Rachel. Hello, how are you doing? I'm well, and thank you so much for the introduction. Um, now, talking about 2016, actually, before we dive into the report, um, I did want to kind of contextualize it a little bit in terms of the history of our landscape and, and where we currently are with programmatic media buying, if you want to hop to the next slide. Absolutely. So um, when I read this, I started to reflect on the fact that a lot of the themes present in the ISBA study, they've really been prevalent. Um, for quite some time now. So the core issues uh, being lack of transparency as it relates to media buying practices. Um, the theme of the K2 report was really highly focused on agencies. I think that the ISBA report is more so focused on the actual technologies, which would imply that, you know, we do have more direct exposure on the client side and the brand side directly into the tech, which is great. Um, but one major call out from K2 as well as ISBA is that reporting was generally really inconsistent. So in both studies, it was a challenge to actually identify trends. Um, and even as simple as contracts looking at um, provisions saying it's expected to have a 10 to 15% variance. Um, I'm sure that 15% is kind of <laughs> top of mind for everybody as we will be discussing the unknown delta in just a little bit. Um, but all of this is to say that the Mighty High POV overall is that the need for transparency is paramount. I also highly, highly recommend reading um, Pete's blog post, as you just men mentioned, uh, for a high level overview of some of the benefits that marketers can expect when they do have um, increased visibility and, and control of where their media dollars are actually going. Uh, no, so now Rachel, to jump into the report itself. I, question <laughs> go ahead, before we go on. You, you mm -hmm. work on, have worked on client engagements where, you know, we are trying to build um, uh, systematic transparency into um, the media buying process and, and getting clients ownership of their data. And so much of this ISB report feels sort of like deja vu from reports that came out. You know, there's this K2 report from 2016, then there's like a programmatic fog report 2017. Yeah, you know, from your perspective uh, of having actually had to do some of this work to help advertisers gain this transparency, you, you know, what's your feeling on how much progress has been made? Do you feel like there's been a ton of progress? Do you feel like this is just deja vu and we're kind of back to square one? 
I think it's both. Um, it's definitely deja vu. That being said, I think that savvy marketers are are asking for what they need and, frankly, what they deserve. Um, I mean, it's easy to say that uh, working at Mighty Hive, where you know we do empower our clients to have increased control, and of course, I've worked on um, in housing projects as you mentioned previously. Um, I think the the capability is there, but it is kind of a squeaky wheel gets the grease for the situation <laughs> rather than a, a tacit expectation that everyone has um, automatic transparency across the board. I like that. The lesson to marketers, be the squeaky wheel. That's good. That's very good. <laughs> All right. So, you know, uh, let's start to dive into some of the, uh, some of the specifics in this report. There's, there's a lot to get through. And I'll say for our audience, we're not going to go through literally every piece of this report. Um, we would be keeping you on this webinar all day if we did. So we're just going to cherry pick a couple things to talk about. So this, this was a great chart. Uh, you know, I look at it, Rachel, and my immediate reaction is, Wow, there is a lot of variance in this data, especially the data and other tech fees. That is just all over the map. Um, is is that is this level of variance normal? What does this chart say to you? Yeah, so um, I'm really glad that we chose to dive into this slide because these are the platforms in which I actually work and, and understand in, in a fair amount of depth. Um, so I'd love to just go fee by fee. Um, starting on the left with BSP fees, um, as you can see across the board, they are hovering around or below 10% um, or so. I think that's totally to be expected in the market across the major DSPs. 10% is something I would consider normal. Um, moving along to ad server fees, they are quite low. Um, I'm a little bit surprised to see that in some cases they're non-existent because um, the, I think the benefit of a, a centralized third-party ad server um, is probably a whole separate webinar <laughs> around um, the ability to do things like dynamic creative optimization and have a really strong um, tagging architecture that that hinges on on the ad server. So. Um, not surprised to see they're low, a little surprised to see that some people don't have them. Um, so moving on to another surprising piece here. So there are also some advertisers who aren't using third-party verification at all. Um, most of the enterprise clients that I've worked with, both at Mighty Hive and in previous roles, they do utilize verification just to ensure that they have an objective third-party assessment of things like viewability, um, sophisticated invalid traffic, et cetera. Um, there are, of course, verification options available that are native to a DSP or an ad server, um, but I think that many do choose to, to layer on another option, so I was surprised to see that missing in some places. Um, but really getting to the meat of it, the greatest variance does come from the data and the other tech fee bucket. Um, it's not explicitly stated uh, what the other tech fee bucket is from the executive summary of the report. Um, but I do think that it, it is a bit of a, of a surprise to see that it is so high, especially at Mighty Hive, we do tend to encourage the use of first party data whenever possible. It's a really valuable asset to marketers. They're likely already investing in things like a DMP or ways to marry offline to online data sets. Um, so capitalizing on first party is, is really essential. So it, it is surprising to me to see that um, data and other tech fee bucket be so high in certain instances. Yeah. And then, you know, on the far right of this chart, um, there's an average there. And you know, as a marketer, maybe you're going to want to benchmark yourself and say, oh, well, I'm going to look at the average, but then I've, I'm also seeing all this variance in the data where maybe the average is, is a bit polluted with outliers uh, in, across various mm -hmm. dimensions. Is there value to that average or, you know, how could an advertiser sort of benchmark these things if that's even possible? Yeah, I think that the benchmarking piece that really does lie in the, the data assets that are available. So if you are a marketer or a brand that has um, a wealth of first party data, I would expect to see that 
hot pink fuchsia bar be um, a bit smaller. Uh, I do think that the mix of, you know, DSP ads or verification looks about in line with what I expect to see. So to answer your question directly, I think that, again, the data piece is the one that requires like the most kind of critical thought. Yep. Cool. Cool. All right. So moving along, um, um, let us take a look at, uh, so this report, I mean, there's so much work went into some of these simple relatively simple graphics that they came up with is, and this took them over a year to do. So it's incredible. Um, and so they, they, they broke everything down into this average uh, waterfall, very familiar probably to a lot of people uh, watching. Um, in your opinion, Rachel, does this look quote unquote normal? Is there such a thing? Uh, I also will point out that uh, we're going to run a poll for everybody right now. We would love to uh, take the temperature of the audience as to whether this looks normal to you, um, you know, just give us your just give us your 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 unvarnished reaction here. Uh, do you think when you look at this, the advertisers getting ripped off? You think the publishers getting ripped off? Uh, do you think this looks just pretty normal based on your experience, or uh, you know, your fourth choice? Don't choose this fourth choice because this is the cop out choice. But the cop out <laughs> choice is that there is no normal waterfall because they vary too much on a case by case basis. Uh, but anyway. Um, uh, send in your answers and uh, uh, give us a little bit of uh, insight into into your reactions uh, uh, on this waterfall chart. Anyway, Rachel, yeah, what do what do you think? Yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what everybody says. Um, but similar to the last chart, I would love to just touch on these buckets one by one. Um, obviously, we have the big call out here for the unknown delta. We're going to get to that. I know that's why everyone wanted to come to this webinar. So I promise we'll, we'll focus on it in a moment. Um, but just to quickly touch on the rest of them, um, the agency fee piece is it's unsurprising to me. If anything, I think it looks a bit low. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the study methodology based on what's in the report itself, but I'm assuming that that 7% is what's actually entered into a platform as a media cost markup rather than like a truly holistic view of an agency marketer relationship. Obviously, mm -hmm. those are very complex. Um, the ways that they're structured can really vary if you're including, you know, speaking as a former traditional media buyer, like if you're including all those sorts of services. Um, I'm sure most people on this webinar are already quite familiar <laughs> with the nuances of agency relationships, but um, DSP fees, yeah, as I touched on earlier, this is pretty much what I would expect. Um, the technology fee is a little tough uh, just because it's not completely clear um, if that tech fee is encompassing everything that we just went through on the previous slide, things like verification, ad serving, et cetera. Um, so I, I will take the cop out answer on that one, but I, I would love to, to dive a little bit deeper into the SSPC bucket. This is something that I've been working a lot on personally um, for Mighty Hive on behalf of our clients. So uh, many advertisers are starting to broker more bespoke agreements with SSPs um, rather than working through an agency um, or just kind of leaving all of the like inventory waterfall decisioning up to the DSP side of things. So I think that this is one bucket that a lot of marketers do have the opportunity to try and reduce. So um, things that you might want to consider in a negotiation with SSP would be um, creative approval fees, any sort of DSP syncing fees, DMP matching fees, second party data, um, the list goes on. I think this is an area in which uh, marketers can, can be much more judicious around uh, trying to trying to reduce those costs. And then lastly, um, I think that a lot of people after this report came out were pretty surprised by the publisher revenue bucket being perceived as low. Um, but you know, each of these pieces of the waterfall are actually necessary uh, to transact media in the programmatic environment. So not too shocked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, well, yeah, let's, uh, let's wait for some of those poll results uh, to come in. Oh, here we go. Uh, so we have 46% of attendees saying the advertiser is getting ripped off. 20% of everybody has said 
the publisher is getting ripped off. 14% say this is normal and 20% took the cop out answer that there is no normal for this. So, you know, Rachel, actually, let's not dive into every single one of these answers, but I would love to know your thoughts on clearly the, the majority opinion is that the advertiser is getting ripped off here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's us having a little fun, editorializing a bit. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess this basically speaks to a lot of the work that you do in terms of helping to optimize this situation on behalf of the advertiser. So just would love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I work at Mighty Hive, so <laughs> I'm definitely uh, aware of the fact that the agency fee bucket uh, can be reduced in, in many instances. Um, and housing is not the right fit for everybody. And of course, we work with people on various hybrid models. But I think that is something that can be reduced, as I just touched on. Um, SFP fees are another one uh, that I think we can work to reduce. And then not to um, jump the gun here, but in terms of the unknown delta, my hypothesis is that the unknowns actually can become known. Yeah. Um, and once they are known, that kind of mitigates the, the ripoff factor if you understand that this is just a necessary, <laughs> ideally a necessary piece of, of the waterfall um, for your business. And that is not jumping the gun. That is called a segue where we can segue <laughs> now into unpacking this unknown delta and really get to the point of, uh, of this episode. So um, let's talk about this unknown delta. Um, you know, first thing that uh, I'll let you dig into here is what might account for it because the report doesn't, it, it does a ton, they did a ton of work auditing everything and kind of un uh, uncovering these underlying uh, issues and uh, sort of questions, but a lot of questions are still unanswered. So what might and might not account for this unknown delta? Yeah. Um... So just to be completely clear, everything that you see on this slide is actually a direct quote from the report itself. So the leftmost column, these are elements that were identified by PwC and the other folks who contributed to the study as potential contributing factors to the unknown delta. And then, of course, on the right, um, you can see that they specifically flagged that this is not meant to be assumed as fraud, um, which I think is, you know, really important because obviously fraud is still a prevalent issue in our industry. Again, that's probably another webinar. Um, bad actors are continually finding, you know, new ways to capitalize, um, especially as we have new formats coming out, like CTV, for instance, is kind of broadly considered to be the new Wild West when it comes to fraud, but I, I won't go too too far down that rabbit hole. But I just do think it's really important for anyone who is um, thoughtfully assessing the study to understand that, um, again, the unknowns can ideally become known um, with what you see in the leftmost column. The kind of downside is that we're not sure which proportion of the unknown delta is comprised of each of these things that wasn't shared with us in the study. Um, but I'm happy to, to speak anecdotally to, um, you know, how to potentially address some of these things as we can do on the next slide. Yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, this one, um, um, this jumped out at me. Uh, we've redone the graphic from the study, but there's, there's a graphic in the study that shows uh, the range of unknown deltas going from all the way down to 0%, which sounds fantastic. Congratulations to that advertiser. Uh, and then all the way up to 86%, which seems like quite a bit. And then the majority, they said, uh, the study said, uh, lay between 2 and 23%. And I will note, this is not to scale. Uh, this is not actual data points from the study. This is purely just to illustrate that 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 uh, distribution that they called out. So, um, Rachel, what do you think this distribution is telling us? Yeah. So, in terms of what the distribution could be telling us, frankly, I'm I'm surprised to see uh, that anyone had no unknown delta. I think it's probably fair to 
hypothesized that that person was doing a lot of direct buys or programmatic guaranteed or transacting their media in a way that um, didn't involve any foreign currency, any bid shading, any sort of post auction discounts. Mm-hmm. And then the 86 percent, I'm not going to make any wild guesses as to where that could come from. Uh, I'd rather kind of focus on on the middle section. Um, so in the interest of trying to, you know, just lend some of my own experience to our webinar audience, um, one that I wanted to touch on is foreign exchange translation. Um, I'm sure that we probably have some global brands on the line here. Uh, This immediately brought to mind for me um, a process that I underwent um, on my team to build out a process for a retailer that um, was headquartered in APAC. Um, All the billing was was centralized in an Asian country, but all of their ad serving and DST entities were set up in local currency because that's how their local offices needed to be billed. Um, So what we ended up doing was centralizing the uh, exchange rate um, translation and we aligned on a certain day of the month that we would have everything billed um, and then subsequently the payments would be made before the exchange rate would change in the local currency. Uh, it was an undertaking, but um, a necessary one. And I just kind of seeing that firsthand um, was really insightful to understand sort of the the tricky nature of, of foreign exchange. Um, another thing that I wanted to touch on in terms of the reasons listed that I I think it's fair to assume it's a pretty major one is the inventory reselling between tech vendors. So the IAB released their new standards last year around sellers.json and the um, supply chain object from the OpenRTV protocol, which will allow advertisers to ensure that any inventory reselling that's occurring or that they're participating in purchasing is actually authorized by the publisher. Um, So I do feel optimistic that the adoption of those specs will drastically reduce the unknown delta. Um, Obviously, ads.txt and app.ads.txt have um, contributed to major strides in the industry to um, reduce unauthorized reselling. But yeah, definitely stuck out to me that the study cited inventory reselling between tech vendors as, as a contributing factor here. Yeah, awesome, thanks. Um, so moving on to uh, another one of the charts from the study that frankly confused me, <laughs> I think probably confused a lot of people, is <coughs> Rachel, can you, can you unpack this chart for our audience? My guess is a lot of people have read this report and are kind of scratching their heads at this one a little bit. Yeah, it was a head scratcher for me too. And um, I, I actually watched the webinar that you referenced earlier that um, Sam Tomlinson and others from PwC did with the ACA. And the way that he phrased it uh, very simply was that as the Delta went up, SSP fees went down more dramatically than the same view of the DSP fees. Um, however, Sam did call out that correlation doesn't imply causation um, and this is a direct quote, uh, SSPs and DSPs taking fees that weren't readily visible in the data shared with PwC would feed the unknown delta. So in terms of the correlation relative to SSP fees, my hypothesis is that the delta probably lies primarily in bid shading. So that was another call out um, as an element that wasn't included in the study data. So Bid chaining remains a common practice. It's typically been more so prevalent on the SSP side of the free service. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the DSP side, it's it's been increasing uh, just given the shift to first price auctions because it is um, causing the bid to occur between the, the first and second price floors. Cool. I, I have a qu- one more question, but before I ask it, uh, I will say for our audience, uh, we are starting to run a little long on time. 
uh, there's been a lot of material to go through. For that, I apologize. I really hope you can stick with us. We're going to do Q&A in just a minute. But if you do have to jump, there is going to be a recording and the slides will be available later. Uh, Rachel, my question is, uh, with bid shading, um, I, I am not a bid shading expert, uh, but um, is that a case where the truth, basically the actual financial transaction that happened between parties just isn't reflected in the log file? That's a really good question. Um, I want to say that it is going to depend on the DSP and or the SSP. Um, some DSPs take a cut of the cost savings that the advertiser achieves via bid shading. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head whether or not it's standard practice um, for that discount to be reflected in, in reporting for the advertiser. Cool. Um, well, you know, it, it took PwC 15 months to figure this stuff out. So it's fair that there's still some, some, some question marks out there. So um, as we start to wrap things up here, um, you know, we're not going to go through every conclusion of this report. Um, but uh, one that, you know, jumped out to uh, Rachel and I in preparing for this uh, was this call for, and clearly there's a need for standardization, there's a call for standardization, but Rachel, you know, given your experience, talk about how realistic you think it is uh, that standards, in, in the sense that the ISBA was recommending there be standards, how realistic it is that, that these standards are going to come, actually come about? Yeah, I think this, this really takes us full circle um, back to the deja vu we were just touching on uh, relative to the, the K2 report and how um, things haven't necessarily uh, had like wholesale changes in the ecosystem. So just to be very direct about it, um, I would encourage advertisers not to wait for the ecosystem to catch up, but rather work on building partnerships with every participant in their own supply chain um, with whom they have a direct agreement. Um, so to touch on chicken and egg permissioning, uh, this was another really great tidbit from the ACA webinar. So in terms of the travails experienced by the PwC team, um, they needed separate permission from the DSP agency and advertiser uh, even if the advertiser and publisher had agreed for data to be shared. So it's kind of like this three-way um, scenario for permissioning. So my, my guidance for marketers here would really be just, I'll try to align on the availability and cadence for data delivery whenever you're embarking on a partnership um, to make sure that you have unfettered access to your data, or at least you have clear expectations set with regards to how long it might take you to actually access your own data. Cool. Uh, all right. Final follow-up question here before we get into Q&A is um, on the chicken and egg permissioning, um, maybe this is just a quick yes, no answer for you, but did that, given your work in this, did that all sort of ring true? You're like, oh yeah, you know, we've, we've been through the exact same thing, or did you have some other impression that, that diverged from what the report said? No, I think it's it's fairly commonplace. Um, I think that it really starts with having um, contracts that are specific to the end marketer, or the end advertiser. I'd say that in my work with Mighty Hive, um, especially with in housing, uh, a lot of the time the initial kind of barrier to entry is just having data portability, having your own seat, not being um, in a situation in which you're, you can't receive log files because it would expose someone else's data to you, um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. All right, well, um, let's do some live Q&A. Uh, like I said before, uh, use the Q&A button in uh, Zoom. I am going to uh, stop the screen share during uh, Q&A and um, I see a bunch of questions. So. Uh, Rachel, are you able to see the questions? I am. Cool. Yeah. I, scan through them and please um, pick whatever jumps out at you. I 
I don't know. Maybe you should pick. <laughs> all right. Let's see. All right. So they're all so good. They they are. Thank you everybody for all these questions. You know, I, I there's a, a question that came in from uh, an anonymous attendee. Hopefully this isn't like a softball question from a mighty hiver, but uh, somebody's asking what tools can automate audits. I mean, it sounds like this is an incredible amount of uh, of work. What what do you use to go through these files? I mean, is this just a big Excel job or what, what are you doing? Um, a lot of times, yes, <laughs> it can tend to be uh, a big Excel job. Um, however, I think that uh, a key consideration um, for, for many of our clients is always going to be read and write API access, um, especially if you are you know, re-architecting or doing any sort of um, like large scale redeployment of campaigns, for example, um, we've built tools to scrape um, websites to understand uh, the data layer at a more granular level to try and do retagging, things like that. Um, so I guess that's bespoke to us, but just generally for when you are, um, buying media uh, on a large scale, I would say that right API access um, is really, really important, um, as well as having regular delivery to cloud storage um, of any reporting data so that you can query it um, at your leisure. Right on. Uh, okay, so here's, here's another one that, that I'm spotting. Uh, hopefully we're not getting too technical here. Uh, but this sounds like a cool question. Uh, somebody asked, uh, does post auction bid shading only occur within an exchange? So my understanding is no. And I believe that this is actually called out in the report um, that there are scenarios in which um, advertisers are receiving rebates um from exchanges so it's not within the exchange per se but rather um what would probably be more colloquially referred to as, as a post-auction discount um or, or a potentially a volume-based discount mm -hmm. okay um here's another one um and we, you know we were going to maybe touch on this in the material but we i think this ended up on the cutting room floor so i'm glad it ended up as a question um can implementing and updating whitelists regularly help to remove the complexity of the programmatic supply chain? And maybe this speaks more to that, that advertiser that had that 0% unknown delta. I don't know. Yeah, I love this question. Um, so I would actually take it a step beyond whitelisting um, and speak more broadly to supply path optimization. So. Um, they're commonly understood to be three primary forms of supply path optimization. Um, the first being uh, exchange selection based on criteria that's important to the marketer. So things like creative formats, um, availability of reporting data, a consistent theme throughout this webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the same things that we just touched on around um, access to uh, APIs, um, a lot of SSPs have audience building tools, things like that. Um, and then the next sort of step above um, from an SPO perspective is finding the most efficient path to supply and buying primarily through that path. So if you know that um, the inventory that you desire from a publisher is only put up on a certain exchange, that would be why you choose that exchange for that publisher. Um, and then lastly, um, using algorithmic means to find the most efficient path to, this, to supply. So things like code-based decision trees that you're deploying in an SSP. Um, I would say that uh, if we're looking at a crawl, walk, run sort of scenario, like whitelisting is, is kind of in that crawl phase of just figuring out, okay, this is the best way to, um, access uh, the supply that, that I'm seeking. Um, I do think that whitelists and blacklists are, are certainly important, but I think the other end of the spectrum is really that more algorithmically based um, path to supply, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Cool. Um, 
Let's do another one here. Um, so this question is, sorry if this was raised earlier in the waterfall slide, the data fee is missing. Rachel, I think you and I were talking about this during our prep. Mm -hmm. Are we suggesting that this is covered as part of the 10% tech fee? That doesn't feel reflective from the previous slide of variance in tech fees. In my experience, data is around 15 to 20% of the ad spend. So yeah, Rachel, uh, I know that you were kind of puzzling over this too. Yeah, no, this is exactly what I had surfaced previously around um, the slide that shows DSP fee, ad server fee, verification, and then data and other tech fees there's not a sort of one-to-one -one of all of those different buckets of fees going into the waterfall slide. Um, so I will admit that I was flummoxed by that as well. Cool. Uh, I, let's... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not it... sure how to, how to hypothesize around um, how, how the buckets across uh, DSP ad server, et cetera, um, you know, fall into the other slide. Miles, do you have any thoughts on that? No, my only point was going to be uh, that um, there is a longer version of this report available. I believe you have to pay for it, but the report that everybody's been able to just access for free online is the summary report. I think there's more data available somewhere. Uh, we have not yet seen that data, um, um, but maybe the in-depth report does a little bit of a better job of reconciling these buckets across charts and across recommendations and conclusions and findings. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's see if we got room for one more. Okay, so, so, so this one, hopefully we're not opening up too much of a can of worms here, but uh, this question says, ignoring uh -oh. the 15% unknown delta, to what extent do you think uh, the supply chain that cuts out 49% of revenue is fair compared to other industries? Is this alone a cause for concern? So, you know, Rachel, from the Mighty High perspective, you know, just typically we're working on the advertiser side. Uh, what's your view on sort of this question of how much quote unquote working media should be reaching publishers? Yeah, I think that that's been a primary focus for a lot of the coverage that's come out around this report. Um, I think that a lot of people see the 51% to publisher stat and are, you know, immediately sort of concerned around um, what's fair um, to our, our friends and on the publisher side. My sort of counter argument to that would be these are enterprise level tools. Um, and, you know, I, I did speak earlier about areas in which fees can potentially be reduced, but for the technology to work, I think the, the power of algorithmic bidding, audience data, onboarding of first party data, et cetera, like that all is necessary and invaluable in, in my opinion. But I'm curious what you think about that, Miles. I mean, I, my philosophical take is the amount of revenue reaching publishers almost certainly cannot be 100% because that would imply basically untargeted advertising, which would presumably perform kind of poorly. And then the publisher revenue might just go to zero because the campaign would be turned off. Uh, and so there have to be, you know, you just pointed out, there's, there basically have to be these layers of, uh, you know, marketing, uh, the impression, like it has to be brought to market. It's not just one of these, if you build it, they will come things. You have to, there, there are going to be fee layers just to sell the impression to, uh, um, to uh, willing advertisers. Then yeah, you've got a target, you've got to personalize, you've got to measure. That's all run by technology that happens to cost extra fees. So by definition, some chunk of the revenue is going to go to those, uh, you know, those middle layers. And so, um, you know, the question to me then becomes, you know, really, it, it is in an advertiser's best interest to maximize publisher revenue to the extent possible because advertisers want good publisher impressions to advertise on. The better the publisher, probably the better the media is going to perform. So, um, you know, getting back to 
at least the you know remarks that I, I gave uh, in the beginning is if we can solve these issues of complexity and transparency, one would think that this would naturally cause more revenue to reach the publisher. Uh, it, would, it would result in better performing media. It should be kind of a win-win-win situation. The only losers being either bad actors in the supply chain or intermediate layers that are just kind of cannibalizing, um, cannibalizing media spend and just no one has yet kind of done the hard work to find out that they're, they're hiding in there. I don't know, Rachel, what do you think about that? No, totally. And I, I'm, I'm glad that you, you touched on the sort of cannibalizing piece. I, I don't want to be overly optimistic. Like the supply chain is by no means perfect. Um, but again, I, I do think that the advancements in various technologies and, and truly just standards in the industry, like I think that if we're taking anything away from this, um, the kind of public um, cry for transparency obviously is a is a major theme, but then also like from a contra contractual perspective, but also the the actual nuances of every node in the supply chain being exposed to an to a marketer, um, to a publisher. Uh, Sellers.json. I I heard someone refer to it once as. Um, a decoder ring <laughs> for supply, uh, which I which I think is great, and I I think is is totally necessary. So there's there's of course work to be done, but I I do think that um, having certain specs in place that like all parties are expected to adopt is really important. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, with that, um, this has been a a marathon live with Mighty Hive. Um, so thanks everybody who stuck with us. Uh, maybe we'll take some of those unanswered questions and, um, uh, we might reach out to you directly. Maybe we can bake it into a blog post. Um, thank you very, very much for watching and for all those wonderful questions. Uh, and thank you, Rachel, uh, really appreciate you lending your, uh, your expertise to this episode. Uh, this has been, uh, I guess fun. Rachel and I have done a lot of work. <laughs> digging into the ISBA report. So, you know, whatever fun means. Um, so yeah, Rachel, thanks. Thanks a lot. Hopefully we can. Um, thanks, Miles. And thank you so much to everyone who came. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. So um, just wrapping up, if you have a question for Rachel, uh, she has been a great sport and uh, provided her email address here, uh, rachel at mightyhive.com. Um, uh, please, if you have questions about uh, programmatic, biddable media, digital media, um, please uh, send it her way. Uh, I want you to subscribe at uh, uh, livewithmightyhive.splashthat.com. That way you stay up to date on all the episodes. And then once again, if you have questions, episode ideas, feedback, et cetera, uh, reach out to us at live at mightyhive.com. Uh, and then we will see you real soon. Uh, we're working on several different uh, new episodes. We got uh, maybe something around Ads Data Hub in the pipes. Uh, we got a couple of brands uh, who are going to be our guests coming up. So definitely subscribe. And uh, we hope to see you uh, very, very soon. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. <laughs>